All right, YouTube. What's up? It's your boy Lunar, and uh, still changing it up. This is uh, a video by Super Sharp Gamer. Y'all know I want to do the gaming stuff. I'm trying to be a gaming YouTuber too. But uh, this is eight reasons why old games were better, and I wanted to react to this because I've been in a whole nostalgic binge. You know, buying old systems and um, refurbishing them and making sure, like, they're in pristine conditions and modding them and making sure I can, like, just play a lot of my old games from back in the day on new, you know, with HDMI cables or just, you know, having them to where, like, I can play them all off a of hard drive or SD card, like, modern systems and stuff and this is uh this this crossed uh my new my feed and it piqued my interest because it's like i wonder i mean i think i have my reasons why i think gaming is changing why old games are better because that love you know that heart and soul was in older games unlike now it's like you know the corporate greed is really you can tell it's there so um um, let's get into it. It's a long video, so this may be an hour. It may be turned into an hour video on, on my channel, but uh, yeah, let's just get into it. Platforming games, racing games, fighting games, adventure games. Racing games were to me a whole lot better in the, back in the day too. Horror games, shooting games, puzzle games, and even sports games. We used to have it so cool. So, what went wrong? I have wanted to make this video for quite some time now. Why are older games better? That's what we are going to talk about in this video. Sit tight and grab a cup of coffee, tea or whatever you prefer because this is going to be a long one. Before we get to my points and reasoning for why I'm saying this, I need to tell you where I'm coming from regarding the gaming landscape. Especially because younger audiences lack the perspective of a gamer who has seen it all growing up unless they have researched it. But even then they don't have personal experience with how gaming was back then and how it is now. It's crazy how small the PS1 got. Like when they made the PS1 even the PS2 Slim, it's crazy like how small the jump, how like the jump in technology was from the beginning of that console's life to the end of it. Even with the PS2, like how big the PS2 started off to the end, to how skinny the PS2 Slim was. It's just crazy from the console jump and like. I mean, even look at the PS3 and the, you know, the PS3 Slim, it got pretty small. But the PS4 Slim, I mean, the PS5 Slim didn't get as small, you know what I'm saying? Like, even though I think that just came around, that was a pretty quick release. The, the Slims back in the day used to come years later. So, I was around when games looked like this. And then we had a lot of room for imagination too with video games. Like when we was playing it, like our imaginations took up. I don't know, like prime example, like to me, playing Metal Gear Solid 3, like how the remake look, I all like to me that's how Metal Gear Solid 3 always looked. Or Halo with the remasters and stuff, that's how it always looked. I don't know, maybe I'm weird. But that's just even with Pokemon, like when I'm running around the Pokemon worlds back in the day to what it is now, like it's just all I feel like Pokemon now feels more empty and it's just the same. It's just in 3D. You know what I'm saying? I feel like I feel like Sword and Shield was like if the game was like made more like Sword and Shield, but that full 3D with the towns and stuff, like how Sword and Shield is, except we could go around the entire town like how it is in Scarlet and Violet. I feel like that would be the perfect blend. Daddy. 
The first gaming system we had at home was Commodore 64 computer with a cassette deck, no less. That's what our parents got us when we wanted the Nintendo Entertainment System, but they found this guy who was selling his C64 and it was much cheaper than the NES. When we were picking it up, the guy who was selling it asked me what kind of games I liked and I mumbled something out of my mouth like Super Mario Brothers? And he was like okay and loaded up Gianna Sisters from one of his multi-game cassettes and I thought okay if it's this or nothing I'll take this. Of course we could oh, wow. never load that Gianna Sisters game anymore because none of us in our family really knew how to use the damn thing. But mainly because most of the stuff we got was very legal copies with multiple games on a single cassette meaning you had to be pretty precise with the tape deck to load what you wanted. The good thing about that was we discovered lots of games like The Amazing International Karate Plus, one of the first fighting games I ever played. The first one would be the very similar The Way of the Exploding Fist. Which was actually one of those few legit games we got with it. So it was easy to load from the cassette because that was the first and only thing on it. So we had some fun with it but we finally got what we really wanted on Christmas that same year. The shiny new Nintendo Entertainment System or NES for short. So I've been playing games on both consoles and on home computers or PC if you prefer for the longest time and I like both experiences for different reasons. And when it was time for 16-bit action, again we had both a home computer and a console. Both had 68,000 heart on fire. Of course I'm talking about Commodore Amiga 500 and Sega Mega Drive or Genesis depending on where you are from. A few years later the console market started to oversaturate with subpar systems from many manufacturers like 3DO companies, 3DO multimedia player, Philips CDI and Atari Jaguar. I read Bro, about them from gaming magazines of the time. But Atari Jaguar looks so fucking crazy. Just for real, for real. And wanted them all because they all looked fine on screenshots. After the fact, I'm happy I didn't get any of them because the good ones were only coming in the next two to three years. Of course, I'm talking about probably my favorite generation of console gaming. The Sega Saturn, Sony Playstation and Nintendo 64. I never had a Sega Saturn but I really wanted one and actually still want one. Someday. Someday. That's why I just got, well I got my Sega Saturn last year. But I just bought the fucking uh, Satiator and my Saturn. Boy when I say playing my Sega Saturn it's different now. Like oh my god y'all. I don't think y'all understand how like buying a Sega like satiator, like I know it's expensive, but if you want to tap into, so one thing I've I've been getting into is Japanese consoles. For some reason, though, like Japanese resellers are way cheaper than American resellers, and so I'd rather just import. And so I bought my Sega Saturn in box, by the way. Like it was in box, of course it was used, but like box the automatic. Like it literally took me back to like 1993, 1994 when the Japanese Sega Saturn released, bro. Like it's insane, like how Japanese people take care of their stuff, especially as kids. Like they're taught, which my dad taught me to take care of my stuff. I just had little brothers, so like a lot of the stuff that we had, like if I didn't give it to my um little brother that that was uh born by my mom like it's lost like he still got my 360 that i gave him. like he everything that i gave him that like say like if i bought a, my dad got me a psp and then he bought a new psp i would give him my old psp and then take the new psp anything i gave him we still got but anything like my other brothers got oh man that shit got destroyed so like our PlayStation stuff, like um, uh, I like uh, this PS2 is my same PS2 I've had since it came out. Like this is my PS2 since I've had it, 
And then my brother still has his PS2 Slim since he got it. You know what I'm saying? So it's just like, um, the any of the PlayStation consoles we still got. Like I, the only thing I don't got is my PS3 Slim because that was the PS3 I got because I ended up finding the Metal Gear PS3 that I was wanting forever. So I ended up like uh, using that as my main console. But other than that, like PS3 Slim is gone, but. On um, my day one PS4 is gone because I ended up having a Final Fantasy PS4. But I still have the console. But with the I just bought this PS1 because I never had the P I had the PlayStation 1, the OG unit, for the longest time. Even with my PS2. But um it was a bit flood in our um when we moved, we moved from, like, across state. And a lot of stuff that I had when I was in Montgomery from when my mom was alive, we lost during, uh, like, the movers just damaged a lot of stuff. And then we had a shed, and then it was, like, a big flood that happened, and we lost a lot of stuff. So, like, other, so that's why, like, you know, like, my Sega Genesis, like, I don't have anymore. I think it got messed up when I was moving from uh, college. And then, um, and this is before I was, like, fixing systems. But my PS1 got damaged in that flood. So, I, um, in the storage flood. So, I've been going back and rebuying, like, all this stuff. And I, I want to mod the PS1, but you can't mod this one. You have to mod the fat PS1. But I'm finding out that you can just put PS one game's on a flash drive and put it in a PS2 and like boot it that way. So I think I'm gonna do that. But regardless of the fact that like back to the Sega Saturn, what I say all that to get to is that I'm finna buy a Super Famicom and do the same thing because like, and I'm gonna buy another Sega Sa a Sega Genesis because like they got these carts and stuff. You can play all your games off of a one cartridge forever. Like that shit to me. I rather like take care of one thing. And make sure the cartridge and stuff, uh, and like that one slot is good. And then collect all the games and just preserve them and keep them up. And like um, make, them an all, make them all into ROMs and stuff. And then buy the Japanese copies of these games. They're way cheaper. Like I got the Japanese copy of uh, Grandia. And uh, found somebody who uh, fucking online. They... they uh, What's the word? They they fucking um, translated it, and then I bound, made the ROM and then put it on my SD card, and now it's on my satiated. Like to me, like people who like can translate games is amazing to me. I can mod all day, you know what I'm saying? It's, I can clean. I can get inside. I can I can make some all day. I can get inside your system and shit all day. But now it's coming to like just to take the software side and the hacking side. That stuff's amazing to me. That stuff is, like, so intriguing. Like, I wish I could. There's so many games that we don't have, you know, that we've lost over time. Not, not just me, but, like, just the world has lost over time. and Or just, like, that was made to, like, that was just stuck in Japan only that we would never get. You know what I'm saying? So, I'm trying to preserve as much as I can. But I sure had PlayStation under my TV for Christmas 1996 and N64 at some point in 1997. A few months oh, after. Oh yeah, and then like they got the like it's a Japanese uh, N64 that I've been looking at, and it's gold. Gotta get that bit. Came out here in Europe. Yeah, it was March 1997 when it was released in Europe. Both of these systems blew my mind so hard, especially Super Mario 64 when I first time saw it playing Why was the SNES released so late in Europe? On some local video game TV show for a preview of upcoming stuff. I knew I had to have it. If you might For Japan to love Europe so much, they sure do get, give everything to them so late. Months later, I did. Nothing had been so mind-blowing when it comes to video games before that and since then. Generational leaps like that just don't happen anymore. Look at some PS4 and PS5 games for example. You have to take out your magnifying glass, digital foundry style, to start picking up differences. 
Sir, the trained I can spot some of them without zooming in 800%, but I digress. So, why knowing this backstory is important? That's because it gives the context for my opinions of what I'm going to say in this video. Now you know how and when my gaming life started and how I grew up and lived through what I call the golden era of gaming, the PS2 generation. Before the DLC, microtransactions, cookie cutter cookie based Ubisoft style open world games, day one patches and overly political correctness. Let's talk about those generational leaps first, because I already touched the topic a little bit. As I mentioned earlier, Super Mario 64 blew my mind when I first time saw it on television. Even though I would have played 3D games on PlayStation before it, like Jumping Flash, which is also a very impressive generational leap coming from 16-bit 2D games. If you came from Super Nintendo Entertainment System to Nintendo 64, where games used to look like this, to games that look like this instead, the jump was humongous. That's true. Duty games were all we knew before the fifth generation of video game consoles. Sure, there were some rough 3D things on PCs and even on Mega Drive and Amiga, but they were usually very low polygon counts, no texture mapping, and very low frame rates at the time when most console games ran 60 frames per second or fields per second. Then suddenly I'm witnessing this new Mario game with a truly realized 3D world and smooth 30 FPS gameplay, texture mapping and texture filtering. Nowadays I prefer the PlayStation look for that era of 3D games with sharp pixels but texture filtering was a thing back then and was appreciated. Like game everybody always say like the N64 was way p more powerful than the um, PS1, but the PS1 just did something different. I don't understand. I can't put my finger on it. Like the PS1 era of video games, and I was so young. I want to say so young. I was like five. Like when I got into gaming, I got into gaming as long as I can remember. My mom was a gamer. But, um, and my uncles were gamer. And, but when I, I remember when I got the PlayStation. So, like, my mom had a Super Nintendo. And the only game I ever wanted to play on Super Nintendo was the Power Ranger game, the movie version, where you they actually morph and shit. I was fascinated by that game. But when I got the PS1 and actually sat with the PS1 and it was mine, like, my daddy said it was mine. So, like, I could play it when I want to. Unless my mom said I couldn't play it if it was school night. She was so strict. Anyway, but I remember, like, when I actually sat with the PS1, I was amazed, like, and I'll be playing shit, not knowing what the fuck I'm doing, but I was so amazed at the PlayStation 1 and just all the different stuff that I would do on there, and it just, it, it, it's, it's, it's hard to explain, but it, it's just, it just has that era, it just has that, 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 I don't know if it's nostalgia, but it's just something about the PS1 era of gaming with the graphics and how they did polygons and like, even with the warp textures and stuff and people, people like, you know, um, what's up Kasune, you get some, get some good rest? Um, even with the, the warp, the, you know, like how the polygon, I can't explain it unless like I actually turn on like a PlayStation 1 game, but like it's certain things, like if you're a gamer and you play, if you're a Sony gamer, like you've been in a Sony like trenches, like, like I have, like the play, like even though the Nintendo 64 was more powerful and like did everything basically flawless in that generation. It's something about, like, the PS1, even though it wasn't the most powerful, how it rendered stuff, you could tell. It's like it was beauty in the ugly and beauty in the, uh, and the, uh, damn, what's the word? God damn. 
what's the word? Like it's it's on the tip of my tongue. Because it's like you could tell like, beauty and the limitation, I guess. That's still not what I'm trying to say. But like with like the, the textures and like the world will wobble as you move because it was loading. It was just like a little warp thing that it had and it was like little shaky stuff here and there. And and then like when certain developers saw that they would like find different ways to um, render or different cheat codes to like get away. The best explanation is like how if you ever play like the Sega Saturn game of uh, Burning Rangers, like how it's rendered is taking like 2D things and like putting them together to make make it look like it's 3D when everything is still um 2d pixels but the ps1 is actually using polygons but the way the camera and stuff moving is like um it's like the lines and stuff aren't matched and stuff it's really weird it's hard to explain but like even like like he said like the that era of gaming the sega saturn ps1 nintendo 64 even though i'm falling in love with my sega saturn because like i never had one and I'm playing all the games that they always said that were like really amazing. I've heard about for years and stuff. I still, I still go like I ever since I modded my PS2 like and got this PS1. I've been going back playing my PS1 games like fucking okay like like um RPGs that got rendered backgrounds. So you know how like uh Cloud on them and Final Fantasy VII were like. Pick the they were they were the polygons and shit, but the background was a two D background made in the three D world. They were just on a drawing, stuff like that is like, I just love shit like that, and no real generation did the whole pre render background like the PlayStation One. Like to this day, I can't think of no games on any console. They may you may have some on Nintendo sixty four, but there's not like like okay like um uh, like all the RPGs that I've been looking at on the Sega Saturn, they're either they're all three D like gr uh gr uh I'm saying Granada uh Grandia, it's all three D and stuff you know what i'm saying like the world is in 3d for real it's very dated like small 3d you know with the um pixels and stuff and like how how they made it but it's not a pre rendered background but if you get on playstation one especially if you play on, play on a crt i just bought a crt and playing uh star ocean on a crt is insane how beautiful that game holds up still looks today playing final fantasy 9 and 8 on a crt is insane how good the limitations like it like that crt mixed with the the limitations of the ps1 is a is crazy how it don't get me started on the ps2 era of video games how like <laughs> i can go on forever let me finish the video let me say sleep and wake up my rat sleeping next to me oh, that's so sweet kind of red is it was more advanced if it had it. 3D accelerated PC games had it and it was preferable to software rendering. Not alone for texture filtering but for higher frame rates, resolution and additional effects. Going for the new millennia and new consoles, Dreamcast, PS2, Xbox and GameCube showed us another huge leap in visual i need to get the xbox and the, and the dreamcast to finish off my uh generation six collection but uh the P i still remember my ps i still remember the christmas i opened up the ps2 it was the last gift my dad hid it in the closet and gave it to me like bro i didn't even care like what's crazy he got me the ps2 that christmas and a ps1 game was strapped to the back of it it was crash team racing and i didn't even care that it was a ps1 game bro i was just like motherfucker i got a ps2 i ran to my room and me and my brother played crash team racing all goddamn night when i say me and that nigga i want to say i beat the game that 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 thing no i didn't 
I couldn't get past uh uh Cortex's race. Uh Dr. Cortex, his race was hard. But well as a kid, but I could beat that shit now easy. But man, I remember that Christmas to this day. To this day. And the first PS2 game I ever got was Dragon Ball Z Budokai. That game was fucking oh my gosh, bro. She was oh, a graphical man. fidelity. You could tell when you saw a PS2 game that it was a tremendous leap from the original PlayStation. Hell no yeah. matter what. And I didn't even understand what graphical leaps was. I just knew when I put in a, a PS2 game for the first time and saw like what a D. I just knew the PS2 was a DVD player. And so when I was sitting there just like watching like the first, the opening of Dragon Ball Z, that was the first time I felt like video games and cartoons were like the same like what i saw on tv is what i saw on the game and that shit blew my fucking mind to this day it still amazes me how amazing the ps2 is like now video games is fucking outrageous like playing final fantasy like playing just a ps5 game that's made for the ps5 like bro it's insane how video games are damn near real life but when i was younger like just seeing like being able to watch yu yu hockey show and then playing yu yu hockey show was fucking crazy to me what game or genre of games it was or watching last time I or watching uh, mortal kombat the uh, no it was street fighter the anime movie uh i remember i remember the, like i i went and uh rented street fighter the movie and then I, my, my friend brought over the Street Fighter game and just seeing the cartoon in the game side by side was fucking crazy in my head. I felt we had such a leap in visuals was the move from PS2 generation to PS3 pop. Now we had fully programmable shaders and the jump to high definition. But I don't remember feeling anything at all when I first time booted a PS4 game. It just looked like a PC version of a PS3 game to me. Higher resolution, better anti-aliasing and higher frame rates. We are now I don't know. I felt something when I played a PS when I played a PS4 game, but it took um any game that was cross uh that was cross compat uh like what was it like uh assassin's creed black flag was out on ps3 and ps4 i could kind of tell a difference but it wasn't until like i played fucking i want to say when i played infamous second son that was like made for ps4 i think that was the first time i was like oh gaming is different now gaming is in the future like that was because like if like that was the first time you could get what you saw from a cutscene in the game, like re like pre-rendered cutscenes that's in game, and you're playing the game all look the same. Granted, they had it a little bit in the PS3, but not like Final Fantasy 13. Like they had like the you know the cutscenes and the and the gameplay the same but like it was scaled back but that was the first time like you can watch one of those fucking CGI movies and they make the movie like the game and like uh what's the prime example um Ratchet and Clank like if you go watch the Ratchet and Clank movie and then watch and play the Ratchet and Clank game it's not it's the same. Now experiencing diminishing returns in graphical fidelity from generation to generation. This is only natural as the more advanced graphics get, but still, it added to the feeling of playing something really new and we don't have that anymore. Really the most impressive thing about this current generation to me was the Matrix Unreal Engine 5 demo on PS5. And even that isn't such a huge leap as we used to have back in the day. It is, it's just the leap. So the leaps now is not in like uh stuff like going from like sprites to polygons and polygons to like rendered cutscenes. Now the leap is like you have an open world and the whole open world is loaded and it's like hundreds of people like 
play Spider-Man on a PS4 and then play Spider-Man 2 on a PS5 and see niggas walking around in the street and stuff. It's insane how many people, like, just, like, the density population of New York. Like, you feel like you're in New York. And you get the mainland, and you get Queens in a fucking uh, uptown uh, Brooklyn. Is it Brooklyn or something? I don't know. I, ain't, I just played the beginning part of Spider-Man 2. I need, to, I need to start back that on stream. But just, like, playing that, Spider-Man 2, and then going back to Spider Man, it's crazy how like like now like the leap is in like the overall overall world like in the game. Like playing Final Fantasy fourteen, like that game is all ray traced shadows and lighting and global illumination and stuff. Shit like that. Like shadows don't like everything can just be ray traced and natural lighting and like the shadows are doing what it's supposed to do little stuff like everything's in like the little details but it all adds up to like something phenomenal like honestly i don't think there should be like a ps5 ps6 let alone a ps5 pro like there's no point your eyes can't even tell no more like once you get the like like people can't even tell the difference between 1080p and 4k let alone 2k and 4k and so it's just like there's no point now to like even go any further because the natural clarity, your eyes can't tell a difference. And we've gotten to that. But, you know, PC people ain't going to never stop because they're like, bro, it's not 144 frames. You again. Like, look at the realistic look. Hold steady. The realistic, like how they gun is by now. So... Generational leaps weren't always just about graphics either. Systems using 10 futuristic CD-ROM technology introduced us to games with CD quality music. Even though I really appreciate chiptunes today, back then it was amazing to have real music instead of beeps and boops. Mm -hmm. Also, I remember when I first time used that analog stick on that N64 pad to control Mario on the screen, it was a revolutionary feeling. Shortly after Sony introduced their dual analog controller for the PlayStation, I knew I, I had to have it. One. Yes, analog controller before DualShock. I have never actually owned DualShock for the original PlayStation, and I think this is still the best feeling controller ever made. I prefer non-rubberized concave sticks and bigger and better shaped handles than the ones on the DualShock. I still think the best analog stick was on the N64 controller though, well, before it had worn down to the point of failure. It was amazing when it was in flawless condition, but clearly flawed design that broke down rather quickly for most people. It just felt different compared to any other analog like stick. The, on like that game, that game right there. You see how that... In flawless condition, but clearly flawed design that broke down rather quickly for most people. This one right here. It just felt. Those are sprites. Those are 2D sprites shaded 3D. That's how the Sega Saturn is. Like, all this is sprites. This is not a 3D world. Like, all this is sprites. Like, like look closely at the tree. You see that? That's just a sprite. But. It, they make they they like basically put like a 3d image on the sprite that's how sega saturn makes their 3d games and gets away with it and on a crt when you put this on the crt it looks 3d like you can't tell which is smart as shit like when you start learning about like the technology like that like the like what's under the hood of these like old systems it's pretty dope how they got away with a lot of shit that's why um uh, in the ps1 sega saturn era of games when they would port a game from ps1 to sega saturn or sega saturn to ps1 then sometimes damn near they had to remake the fucking game because what they was doing on sega saturn they can't do on the playstation and then what they're trying to mimic, what they're what they're mimicking on the PlayStation, they can't do on the Sega Saturn. After this, I will uh, pull up 
well damn this is a youtube video you're not gonna see it uh i may make a part two to this where i go look at side by side videos uh ps1 games to take a saturn game so you can see the difference because it is a difference like right now you can't tell but i'm pointing out but like all of this like this right here like this is a sprite and like you see how like you got the shadows right there to make it look 3d if you was to turn this image sideways it'll just be multiple images layered to make it look 3d it's really fucking amazing how they did all this shit different compared to any other analog stick on a controller and, ever and seen. this is actually polygons like that's why the n64 was so great but you could tell it's actually polygons because it's empty like texture mapping and stuff was in its infancy on the ps1 uh ps1 Sega saturn n64 era so that's why when you would get an actual 3d game it looked very bare and empty and just like open like um if you if you guys know what the uh kingsfield games are on ps1 that shit was open and bare um the armor core games of ps1 the tomb raider games the turok games on n64 and stuff very very yes. open if you haven't games. experienced it you and don't know that, what i'm talking and they had that weird fog to load the polygon talking about so. at least dual sense or dual sock 5 as i like to call it has something new and exciting going for it with haptic feedback and adapted triggers but still i don't think it's such a game changing thing as the first analog sticks on controllers were Maybe virtual nah, reality the motion sense controllers. Is crazy. Nah, he's he's sleep. The dual dual sense controller is the best controller ever made, like ever. Like they can can't top that. offer something truly new and ground It's the best feeling controller. Like after using the fucking PS5 controller, like the dual sense controller is like the best feeling controller ever. To this day, like ever. Like I had to buy an Xbox Elite controller just to play my uh series x just to get it somewhat feeling because the the regular xbox one controller feels like a a toy now compared to the king i had htc5 for some time and i think it was neat trick for a while but i don't think that's how i want to play most of my video games i ended up selling the thing when it was untouched in my closet for three months The next thing on my list of why old games were better is the fact that when you bought the game before the always connected era, you knew you'd get a full and working product. The game was on the disc or the cartridge, ready to go and playable from start to finish without the need for any up. Uh, why? I don't know why he showed Metroid Dread because uh, I don't think that whole game is on there. They had to update it. Updates at any point or even online connectivity, which slows down. Fun fact. If you see a PS2 disc that has a blue ring, that's a PS1 disc. It's just coated in blue to work, to use the PS2 uh, system. Like, it's a PS1 disc. Like, also, all these games, all the PS2 games that came out, like, in the first couple years were, P were games that was made on, like, PS1 software upscale using... Um, like PS2 demo kits and then they ported it to PS2 but that's a PS1 disc like they made the game on a PS1 disc game menus for example because they sent telemetry to the publisher about everything you do in the game for example before I connected Tekken Tag Tournament 2 online the menus and loading were way faster what a mistake I'm not saying that game breaking bugs didn't exist at all but at the time, they were way less common because these developers and publishers knew they were impossible to fix after the fact. And some games received newer revisions on later prints to fix some issues. A fine example is Gran Turismo 2 on PlayStation where some races had rivals impossible or at least close to impossible to beat because the game had a bug that allowed the computer to enter with a higher class vehicle than intended. This was corrected on later runs of the game. So, one could argue that updates are good. Well, yes. If it didn't lead up to releasing games mainly broken on launch with release it and fix it later mentality. 
some games never get truly fixed. Also, if I'm not mistaken, Sony has a policy in place where the game is required to be on the disc playable from start to finish, if yeah. it releases physically that is. But apparently this is not enforced by Sony very much, because there are a few examples having minimal data on the disc and the rest is downloaded from the internet. So back to my point that back then No, that's not true. Like um the only games that have minimal data on PS4 and up now is games that are like online games like Destiny and Fallout 76 stuff like that. But like no, Sony if it's a um single player game, Sony doesn't force that. Like you can play like um when I had Cyberpunk um I still got Cyberpunk Punk, you can still play through it from start to finish with all the bugs and shit um with no patches and stuff so like no they do enforce that rule you knew the game was fully on the disc when you bought it and it will work as long as your device free it's crazy how virgin mobile used to have make video games like virgin mobile and virgin like the cell phone company used to make games bro the disc no servers are needed for acquiring patches and game data needed to play the game one could say you had literal ownership of the game not to be confused with intellectual property or IP of the copyright holder, but the ownership of your copy of the software. You could lend it to the friend, you could sell it, give it to somebody, or keep it forever. No online checks and DRM schemes to verify your right to play. Your right to play was guaranteed by having the disc, cartridge, diskette, or even cassette in your hands. Sure there were convoluted DRM schemes on PC games back then too, but this wasn't an issue with console gaming really. Now I have PS4 games on myself that say Ultimate Edition on the box, but when you open the box, the disc inside is just for the base game and additional content was given to me that was an online game only though as redeemable codes in other words the physical copy of the game really isn't the ultimate edition isn't it if i was to sell this game now when i have used the codes for the additional content should i sell it as the base game that it really is for the buyer at that point or just say Ultimate Edition and the codes might have been used. I'm pretty sure the buyer would be too happy about it. Then there is the collector's problem. A buyer who wants the base game wouldn't want this box and the buyer who wants the Ultimate Edition wouldn't get it. This game is literally unsellable and that's by design I think. These companies have always wanted to kill the used game market. I don't have issues like that if I wanted to sell any of my PS2 games for example. True ownership, all of the content it came with. Of course we have the exact same issues as a buyer. I can confidently go and buy a PS2 game or even PS3 game knowing that the whole game is on the disc playable from start to finish. On PS3 there might be some updates but nothing on the magnitude of modern games. And maybe some games had online passes you would need to buy if you wanted to play them online. But that really isn't a concern for games whose servers and online support are long gone anyway at this point. And when I say the whole game is on the disc, I also mean no DLC or downloadable content as it was known during that era when primary distribution was still a physical product. That leads up to my next point. The dawn of the DLC was on Xbox during the 6th generation of consoles, but it wasn't really a problem yet. It was truly used when- Have y'all noticed that like DLCs and updates and all that stuff is a Microsoft thing? Microsoft started all this shit, and now they're trying to push out physical media as a whole. Like, I love American made companies, but they're so fucking greedy, bro. And they are so fucking scandalous, man. Like, Microsoft introduced DLC, introduced the online, like, I like online playing and stuff, like, like, they did a lot of good, but, um, it ain't like how Sega, with, with their online stuff they was trying to do, it was to enhance the game, like, um, like, what was that Dreamcast 
Oh, fuck. They had the online stuff on the Dreamcast. Even with the Sega uh, Genesis and stuff they had online, which is crazy to think about. But it was like communities and like chat rooms and stuff like that. And um, those games where they was like, you know, part of a talk show like Nintendo did with um, in Japan back in the day. But Xbox started all this stuff, bro. And they are the ones like trying to do the digital only. Like the Xbox One, like they made a digital only Xbox One. That's insane to think about, bro. Like if down the road when physical media is gone, blame Microsoft. And blame all those people who like who who's in love with Game Pass. Like Game Pass is like ruining Microsoft. Why like that's why Microsoft is like having to double back on a lot of stuff and try to make a lot of their games uh third party and like they're they're basically becoming a new Sega. Because they they wanted to, they did everything y'all said, and now they made it Netflix for gaming, and Game Pass is hurting them more than anything. And so now instead of like looking at like you know the user base of their consoles, they're just like we gotta have Game Pass on everything to make money. Granted, um, Microsoft has money to just fucking throw away because they been making money since the 80s but in the long run that's not viable you know what i'm saying so when y'all xbox heads like all my xbox games i buy like even if it's digital i still buy it i'm not a part of game pass enhance the games you enjoyed playing the most nothing was chopped away from the games before the release to sell you separately or upfront as a more expensive edition of the game. Sure there were expansions for some games, especially on PC already at that time, but even then they were huge packs that expanded almost all aspects of the game and you really got your money's worth when you bought them and they weren't chopped away from you if you didn't buy the more expensive game. I'd be naive to think they didn't plan some of these expansions beforehand but still, it wasn't the PS tasting thing like these days. The DLC isn't even most of our worries these days when buying a game. On top of whatever a modern AAA game costs in your region, modern games have the audacity to ask for more of your hard earned money when you just bought it. I'm sick and tired of hearing that it's just optional cosmetics things etc etc. No it's not. For example, in some Ubisoft games, they literally sell you Time saver, ultimate. That's just so sick, bro. Ubisoft is the worst. All this shit used to be in game, bro. Assassin's Creed, like you wanted that armor set, you could you could go do the missions and unlock all the pieces to get the armor set. Now you just buy it, bro. Like Assassin's Creed, it used to be one of my favorite franchises, bro. Actually, admitting damn. the game is not properly balanced without this optional thing you can buy for more money. And even if it was only cosmetics, I actually miss the days when additional costumes or characters, among other things, were unlocked by playing the game. We get to my next point from here, the cheat codes. Yeah, back in the day we used to have cheat codes in games, to make them easier, harder, or other things to have more fun. I wonder if the Konami code still works in Konami games. That's something I need to check to see. Like, if you bought a Konami game back in the day, you could put in the Konami code, the Konami Konami code, in the start screen or like some, some like in the PS2 era, it was like it had a little menu or whatever you could put it in, and you could unlock a plethora of shit for the game. It was so dope, and don't let you have like saved memory data from like other konami games that shit was dope Cap Fun. capcom was the same way too like resident evil i forgot what you unlock i don't know i just remember like playing resident evil and then it seemed that i had a save from a Mega Man game and i it unlocked something i forgot but now in the era of microtransactions and in-game purchases seats have to be bought for more money a fine example of this was in NHL games where you basically were required to have this golden stick thing to be competitive. 
I'd say that Ubisoft Time Saver is one form of cheat as well because you gain more experience points than the players who oh, don't no, want to waste money it. on that. I'm not saying everybody should cheat in video games, especially online games. It should be zero tolerance, but I mainly talk about single player games here. But back then, if you really wanted to cheat, it was free. And last but not least, when you were mostly done with the game, it was time to have fun with game breaking cheats. Even if you thought games were too hard or not, so you wanted to utilize the cheat codes, it's just to my why old games were better. Next thing I think old games did better than the new ones is that they didn't think the player was brain dead. Sure, there were some cryptic and confusing things because of mistranslations and even because of poor game design, but mainly Games were challenging but still fair, especially during the 5th and 6th generation of consoles, which would be the original PlayStation Saturn and N64 to Dreamcast, PS2, Xbox and GameCube. There weren't obvious go here markers in games like Final Fantasy VII, for example. It put you on this huge map and lets you go to do your thing as a player. Yeah, sure you could waste your time and wander around aimlessly before going in the right direction and get clues from the people who lived in those places. You actually needed to listen, or in this case read, and pay attention. Y'all see how this is like a, like this looks 3D, but all this is the pre-rendered background and you see how the polygon is basically like sitting on top of the stuff. And then how PlayStation made like stuff like this, like like these polygons, they're just sitting on like they're like make they just look like they're sitting on these seats and stuff. It's amazing how like pre-rendered backgrounds looked so amazing back in the day. But then they would do tricks like um like say this door will open, this would be like on a um digital layer and a door will open. Or like say like it wanted to look translucent or something, or you had to have it, you wanted to make it look like he was behind something. This part will be sitting, like this picture they will put like um, like see that like how his head like bro like pre render like how they did the pre render stuff was so dope. Because this was the direction you were given, and then you had to think a little like, and go from there. In this case read and pay attention because this was the direction you were given and then you like all of this pre-rendered so like you see how like this dude right here looks like he's in front of this and it's hidden so like they would draw this image and then they would cut out this part and then put the polygons how it would be and then layer like make it look like it's layered on a 3d world and then just make it to where like this would be like you know how like you um like how you edit in pictures or something and then like you have the different layers that's where that came from it's from like the place like place like sony and all them how they made the pre-rendered backgrounds when they would layer like the different images and stuff it came from like this shit so like when the when the character the player character will walk through this layer is in the front to where it like whatever you draw behind it whatever come in front of would not like overlap this like that technology came from this shit was so fucking you had to think a little and go from there games and didn't then, and then what was dope is like say like they wanted to walk into the picture they would just instead of like making like it look like he's going down a hallway the fucking polygon will shrink and get enlarged shrink and get enlarged but now on today's technology with flat screens and pixels and shit we can see all that but back in the day on that crt damn my damn thing froze back in the day on the crt it when it shrink on that crt it looked like it was going down a hallway and stuff it was so amazing and then when they did the pre-render cut scenes and the fmvs from the uh pre-render backgrounds and stuff 
they shot it all in game so that way the f and b f back like if you play this on a crt and play the image on a crt with the pre-render background going into the fmv it all looked like all it looked like it was the same thing like they was faking the funk which now the cutscene and the gameplay is the same fucking thing think you were stupid they were designed in a way that they counted on your ability to figure it out and if you didn't they happily sold you the official strategy guide I kinda miss those too. The Lots of times error. you didn't even need to buy them separately. The PS4 error strategy guys are like I still have all of them. Like I still got the Final Fantasy Type 0 one. That's a hard game. If you read the gaming magazines because they included them regularly. And if you still needed more help, there were those cheats for free. All you needed is to so acquire them from somewhere. In? And like yes, this is a, you see how this is pre-rendered back? Like this is the FMB. FMB. Usually every single issue of those gaming magazines yeah, had them too. Another how, thing. You see how the polygons were sitting there shaky? That's what I was talking about. That PlayStation 1 era of stuff. It's all in the game. Look. All you needed so is like, to acquire the them FMB. from somewhere. And yes, usually every single... And you see how the camera's zooming in? This is all... This is all in the FMV, but they layered the, the 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 characters on top, and now like they're shaky. That that's that that's that PlayStation One shit I was talking about. It's just that shaky shit. Issue of those gaming magazines had shaky. them too. Another thing I didn't even plan to. And then when the train stops, watch how the train is 3D right now, and then when the train completely stops, it's going to it's going to switch to a pre-rendered background to a drawing and that's what i'm talking about like how they was do the trick to include in this video boom you saw the switch i don't know if you can tell the switch and but you could tell it swapped because of the background because like look at the characters and then look at the train hold on hold on, hold on go back like you could tell it stopped when the characters in the train another thing i didn't even plan to include in this video and you see that blink how they all blinked and it went that was it that was the game loading the pre-rendered background and now you see like the detail in the train is back like the, well the detail in the train is there because like it's a pre-rendered it's a pre-rendered uh background okay journalist was so much and then they all jump out of it bro that's what i love that's the shit i was trying to explain about playstation one like that playstation one era of graphics and just that just that that care and the little stuff that they did to like trick us to making this shit seem seamless like the, just a little tiny shit this bro. video even be like that like bro like when I was little, I never looked at the blanket, but like now that I'm older and shit and learning how like game development works, bro. I didn't even plan to include so in this dope. video. Even That's video game dope. journalism was so much better than these days. And then you could tell it was, uh, I'm sorry, I keep stopping the video, but then like they didn't like when they went from the FMV to the pre render background, they, they used, they had like, they didn't match the color one to one. So like the shading of the bricks and stuff like this is Tanner. Like this background right here is tanner than the actual uh, background. This video, because... even video yeah, game journalism of those gaming magazines had the them too. See, Another I like thing this. I didn't even plan to include in this video, even video game journalism was so much better than these yeah. days. We all know video game journalists are a joke today. They talked about games, and only games, not politics, and their goal was to help and provide information to players. God damn that jump. I can understand if younger people especially would Damn going from fucking Final Fantasy to this shit was a crazy leap. ...think that all the games were hard and punishing because sometimes they really were. But I'd argue as well that they were also way more rewarding when you eventually overcame the challenge or figured out something instead of an arrow pointing you to the next thing you needed to go. Or some this brat yelling you the solution. This is the PS3 lore, Croft. This ain't... 
Is this P this gotta be PS3? Something. To the puzzle before you even had the time to give yeah. any thought to how to solve it. And then there were way more genres in gaming back then because there weren't real standards on how to do things yet. Especially when we moved from 2D to 3D. Sir, some of those designs were bad, really bad. But what I'm trying to say is that when there was more experimentation, we had more the diversity in how the games were played. Meaning that if you finished game A and started to play game B, even if it was somewhat the same genre, it probably played very differently. And we get to my next point from here. So, we had way more varied game designs and genres of the games back then. Partly because real working standards weren't figured out by developers yet. You could argue, of course, that it's better now, because we have those standards, for example for third person shooters. Yeah, sir, I agree with you, to some extent, but it also creates a problem for me. Every single third person shooter game feels like it's exactly the same game to me, just different window dressing. Add to that a typical cookie cutter empty soulless open world of today, and we have a cookie cutter modern third person shooter open world game in our hands we have played through too many times at this point. It's just not enough anymore that a story changes, theme, graphics, characters, whatever it is, to differentiate these things. At least it's not enough for me anymore to keep my interest. Especially because stories, the content and character designs, especially female designs, have to be overly politically correct these days. I have zero interest in them anyway. I have to mention the Ubisoft formula and how tiring it is at this point. How many times you have played the same game that basically started somewhere like Far Cry 3 or something, or the original Assassin's Creed? Discover a huge empty map, liberate some outposts from enemies, climb a tower and reveal more of them. Rinse and repeat 50 times. I'm sick and tired of that formula in 2023. It should go away and preferably never come back. If you want to make an open world game in 2023, it really has to have something else going on for it than this copy paste Ubisoft formula. The open world used to be my favorite video game genre, for example my all time favorite game Super Mario 64 kinda had an open world and it was my first experience with such open-ended gameplay, and I loved it. Sure, probably some of it was because it was so new at the time. Of course, Mario 64's world is very segmented and small by today's standards, but it was impressive back then, on N64 of all things. And last but not least, I have to mention the death of B games or double A games, or whatever you want to call them, as long as you don't call them middleware, because that's a completely different thing and out of the scope of this video, but for example, Havoc Physics. That's what I missed the most, the, the, the double A games, that was the, that, those are the games you can run into Walmart and get for like 20 bucks, if I'm in Walmart, what, it's just me and Pops. I'm like, hey, Pops, this game only $15. Can I get it? You know what I'm saying? You slide and get that. Then the games I love the most. I played the fuck out of a lot of those games. And Speed 3 are middleware technologies to speed up game development. So, for simplicity's sake, I call them B game in this video. Nowadays, we mainly have two categories of games, or at least two that'll get the most media attention. AAA the AAA indie. games like Marvel, Spider-Man, Call of Duty, etc. And then we have indie or independently produced games that are completely opposite of the production value and budget of the AAA stuff. But we used to have plenty of games that landed somewhere in the middle. The B games. Couple examples of B game would be something like Wet for the PS3 and Xbox 360. Published by everybody's favorite Bethesda Softworks and developed by Artificial Mind and Movement, today known as Behavior Interactive. 
And here you can see this game's middleware solutions. So the game is not middleware. It's a B game or A or double A, but I promise to call them B games to not to make it more confusing. Another example is Yakuza Fury on PS2, and it's a 3D beat em up of all things. Those were extinct pretty much at this point already, and I was very sad about it because it was one of my favorite genres of games. This one is published by 505 Game Street, or now just 505 Games, and developed by Winged Un Systems. Even sounds like a B game developer. Yeah, I never heard of that before researching it for this video. So Matt, so so what is this a uh, female version of uh uh Damn what's the name of that game? I just bought it. I'm finna say Mad Max. Uh Damn He got Bullet Time is made by Rockstar. Uh Damn what's the name of that game? Damn, what's the name of that game? Max Payne. So, this type of Wing at Un Systems even sounds like a B game developer. Yeah, I never heard of that before. It's a 3D beat em up of all things. Those were extinct pretty much at this point already, and I was very sad about it because it was one of my favorite genres of games. This one is published by 505 Game Street, or now just 505 Games, and developed by Winged Un Systems. Even sounds like a B game developer. Yeah, I never heard of that before researching it for this video. So, this type of game will last between then and now. Sure, there are some games, especially in the JRPG genre that would fall in this category or games like Nier Automata. But they aren't as nearly as common as they used to be. And the reason I love this game so much, because they kinda look like games that belong on the system they were designed for, but of course couldn't match AAA production quality. That didn't mean they weren't fun games. Actually, more often than not, they were more fun than many AAA productions yeah. that started already to fall into the trap of cookie cutter standardized molds. And no, indie games aren't a replacement for them. Most indie games just aren't interesting enough, and most importantly, don't Thank look the part. What independent people be, people be like getting mad because folks don't be wanting to play indie games. Like, don't get me wrong, I got a couple of indie games that I fuck with. But like for every one indie game I fuck with, it's like forty five of them that I don't fuck with. Like it's so many. It's just a bunch of indie games that just look like shit. And I'm tired of like reviewers and like all these old heads that be over hyping these indie games, bro. And it's just like they just cater to like old niggas, bro. And I'm probably an old nigga myself, but it's just like, damn, bro, like, them indie games, bro, it's just all pixel games, it's just, when we gonna get to where, like, indie games look like, you know, a double-A game, like, some 3D or something, like, why everything gotta be, like, super pixelized and stuff, and don't get me wrong, I love pixel, like, most of the games I play on my Steam Deck have been pixel games, but it's just, like, a lot of the indie games, I don't know, it's just, like, they be missing something to them. Independent game today comes or even too fucking short. That costs too much. Close to matching AAA production values of today. There can be hidden gems. Oh damn, I love that term. There can be hidden gems in the fast sea of software quality indie games, but it doesn't mean that they aren't mostly garbage. Yep. Just like software games were back in the day that was made for best-selling systems just for the fat gas crap. And a lot of indie games, you know, asset flips and stuff, they just like there to just cost 99 cents to get your money. But uh, YouTube, uh, let me know if you fuck with this video. 
it's probably like over an hour long at this point. I don't know how long this damn video is on my end, but I enjoyed it. I like trying to like differentiate my um library of videos, even though none of the videos like this get views. But uh, like, comment, subscribe. Come fuck with us on Twitch over here. We chilling. We vibing. I'll holler at y'all later.